on it all week. But, hey, didn't know who was going to be here this morning. But I tell you this, it's for me. And it's for you. If you think it's not, you're in real trouble. I hope you pray for me this morning. I, I don't want to hold you any longer than what the Lord wants me to. I'll, uh, <laughs> I heard, you know, if you pay attention, you hear little things. People talk. Sometimes they think you ain't listening. <laughs> but I heard we, we hold a little long here. <laughs> you know that? There's a visitor who's been here quite often. This little small voice. She was telling her mom last night, yesterday, I was talking about being in church today. I don't even know what the conversation was. But I heard a little voice say, I tell you, Mom, their services are long. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, I thought I had one in my corner. <laughs> Listen. If you look with me in Matthew chapter 16, the Lord asked his disciples, those closest to him, those that had been handpicked by him, he asked them a very in-depth question, very in intense, a critical question concerning eternity. Matthew 16 verse 26 says, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Oh, this is as simple as it gets, ain't it? You know, so often we think uh, that's a question the sinner needs to ask himself. You're right. This is a question that you and I need to ask ourselves. The Lord posed a question to his disciples. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, we never get beyond pondering this question in our walk with the Lord. This conversation started as Jesus began to foretell the disciples of his sufferings and his crucifixion. Look with me, we'll begin in, chapter, uh, in verse 21 here. I want to read just a little bit. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now, the word of God says, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Now, I want us to understand what led up to this question that the Lord was asking his disciples, what shall the prophet? He saw a need to, to gear his thoughts in this direction because of Peter's response just by knowing the Lord's destiny. He saw that Peter placed too much emphasis or put too much priority on this flesh and this life here. The Bible says Peter took him. Now I want us to understand the, the intents of the situation here. When the Lord told his disciples of his death, of his sacrifice of the perfect will of the Father for him. He was going to suffer and even die. The Bible says Peter took him. It don't mean that he just said, uh, Lord, would you get a chance? I'd like to talk with you. If we could meet, you know, maybe later. No, but he ran to him, Brother Chris. He laid hands on him and he took him. Violently in his response to what the Lord was going to do, Peter took the Lord. He took a hold to him and began to rebuke him. The Lord Jesus. He began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall 
shall not be unto thee. He didn't want the Lord to leave him, did he? He, did, he didn't want the Lord to depart from his presence. Because all he could see is his sufferings, his hurt, his death, and his absence from them. He took him, rebuked him, be it far from thee. It shall not be so. He was thinking physically, emotionally, carnally of the cost of pain. And in this, he encouraged Jesus to avoid it. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Uh -huh. Now, I want you to realize Jesus immediately recognized where this train of thought came from. Yeah. Hmm. You see what we're building up to here? Jesus immediately thought to himself, Peter don't even understand who's got in his train of thought. You see, we as humans, we have feelings. Some of y'all think I don't have any feelings. <laughs> I have feelings. I get them hurt once in a while. Huh? Peter had feelings. We as humans, we have feelings. And, and, and we priority th prioritize things in our lives. Right? But the Lord saw a great danger in this for Peter's sake. Because he wasn't thinking spiritually, he was thinking calmly. Hmm? Concerning the very perfect will of the Lord. But he realized where this train of thought was coming from. Verse 23 says, But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. He knew Satan was, was, was directing his train of thought. Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. That's, that's very dangerous, even for a child of God. Right? We, we all, I believe everybody in here probably raised your hand was saved by the blood of Jesus. You know what? We still better take heed to the word of God. That's right, yeah. Thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Carnally thinking, worldly thinking, just like the world would think. Romans 8 and 7, Paul tells us the carnal mind is what? Enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. You see, long as, long as there's a uh, uh, an ounce of carnality in our mind, as long as Satan has any control of the way we're thinking, then we're, we're, we're enmity with God. Right. Ephesians 4 and 7, 17. Walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. We better get to a place in the Lord to where the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God only right. is governing our thoughts, That's our, right. our reasoning, yes, our, our, our affections. Peter had not yet reached that point. Peter had a long ways to go also, didn't he? Yes, he Philippians 2 and 5, it's already been shared, I believe, twice this morning also. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We're going to have to be thinking like the Lord. Yes, we are. We're going to have to allow the Lord to govern our thoughts. Yes. If not, we're going to miss it. Peter had appraised life and soul. Very quickly, he had appraised life and soul as the Lord was speaking of his death. And what happened? He placed the greatest value on life. Right? Be it, be it, be it not so. This is not going to happen. I don't, I'm not going to allow it. He felt the Lord was more important to him there, right there in the flesh. He wasn't thinking spiritually enough. Look with me verse 24. 
The Bible says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Right? And follow me. If any man will come after me. What's this simply mean? Being a child of God. Being a disciple. Being a follower of the Lord. That's all, that's all this means. But in order to do that, the very first thing we're going to have to do to do is deny ourselves. Refuse his own claims on himself. Right, right. You know, we, we are not our own anymore. Once we become a child of God, we're bought with a price. You know, we, we, we don't belong to ourselves anymore. It's not, it's not all about what I want for me, but, but I have to find out what God wants for me. That's very important. Take up thy cross and follow me. He's speaking to his disciples, those handpicked of the Lord, these guys who had the goods, right? But he's encouraging them here to take up their cross. In other words, lift it up on high. Don't try to avoid the cross. You know, so many people want to make it to heaven without bearing the cross. Jesus said, if you're going to be one of me, one of my disciples, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to deny yourself. Take up thy cross. Mm -hmm. Lift it up on high. No avoid it. No going around it, going over it, going under it. People will try to find every avenue, any avenue they can to make it to heaven except the way that the Lord has laid out. Take up thy cross. Follow me. Verse 25 says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. You know, so often we, we appraise our lives more valuable than what they are. Now, now life is precious. I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. And, and the Lord expects you to treat your life like it's precious. But we can't appraise our life too valuable over our soul. Right. It's, it's not as important as your soul. Right. So many times we appraise our lives too valuable in comparison to the soul of man. Listen, we, we are only dust. Did you realize that? Mm -hmm. From, and, and we're going to return back to dust. The Lord took dust from the earth. And he formed man in his likeness, in his image. And I don't know if he stood upon his feet or if he laid on the ground or whatever. But up until that point, he was only, I've used this phrase here before, just a big old six-foot dust bunny. That's all man was. Until the Lord breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a what? A living we can't place too high of a value on our lives and let our soul go lacking. We just recently bought a house. We went and looked at this house. We looked at several. We found one we felt we could afford and we felt it was a, a nice house and a good house for the price in comparison to everything that we had looked at. The seller felt very good about his house and he placed a price on his house. The realtor felt very good about it, posted the house, put it on the market at this price. We saw it, went and looked at it. We liked the little house, and we thought that in comparison to everything else, we're, this is a good price. We signed a contract, said, we'll, 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 we'll buy the house. We'll give you this price. They're asking price. If you hadn't bought a, a house in, in this county lately, you you know, you, you'll under, you, you're in for what good experience. It's the seller's market. Yes, it is. But listen, we said, from there, I, put, I signed the contract. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give you this price. Because I hired a, a home inspector. He come out, went over the house. I went, went, I went under it, over it, everywhere. Clint, this is a good house. We went 
to the bank. We want to borrow money by this house. Okay. Our realtor we was looking at said this is a good house. Good price. He'll, he'll get you this if you want it. Right? But okay, we'll sign a We'll get it. But the bank, who had the money? <laughs> See, I didn't have no money. <laughs> I was trying to buy a house without no money. <laughs> but the bank had the money. So they send them a, their appraiser out. Right. The one who's going to qualify the house. Don't matter what I say. Don't matter what the seller thinks. The man with the money is going to tell you what the house is worth. That's right. He went out and looked at it. He appraised the house for fourteen thousand dollars less than what they was asking for. Fourteen thousand dollars less than what I was going to give him for it. The house ain't worth that, Clint. It's way down here. You know, sometimes we we're, we're blind. Sometimes we, 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 we place high values on things yeah. when really the one who knows says it ain't worth it. That's right. It ain't worth it. That's right. It ain't worth it. Right. What about your soul? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, right. thank the Lord. You know what? He sold me the house $14,000 less than what I was going to give him for. Right. Thank the Lord. Somebody ain't had enough sense to know what it was really worth. Sometimes we place too high value on things in our lives, don't we? Huh? What about your soul? I want to ask you something this morning. If you would, right now, if you want to close your eyes or maybe not, but in your own heart, in your own mind, I want you to place your soul on the scales this morning. You know what an old set of scales looks like, the balancing scales? You place something on this side and it, it sets way down. And then they start putting something here to lift the scale. To sit. Place your soul on the scale this morning. Right. What can you weigh it with? Right. Right. What, what can you put over here that would lift that soul up? You want me to tell you? Nothing. Right. Nothing. You may think, well, oh, there's something, this, this is very important to me. It won't budge the scale. What is it worth? Listen, we must first acknowledge that the soul is immortal. It will live on forever. We must admit that it's either righteous or that it's wicked. We must understand it will in eternity enjoy complete blessedness of God or it will endure complete sufferings of hell. Now, you've got to understand that, or else you can't even begin to. I mean, that's the first thing you've got to know. Right. My soul is going to live forever. Yeah. It's going to either be in heaven or in hell, one or the other. I want to tell you something, a, a little statement I read in a commentary that stuck out to me. The, the little statement here said, the sufferings of hell have just begun. They have just begun. How many thousands and thousands of years have people been in hell? But listen, the sufferings have just begun. What's that mean? There is no end. There is no end. You think the flames have have died down in? No. No. The sufferings have just begun. What has a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own? In 1 John 2 and 16, well, let's flip over. I want to read verses 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. Hmm. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Forever. Listen, this world and everything in it, every ounce of joy, every ounce of pride, every every red penny that exists is going to pass away one day. 
It won't even exist anymore. But your soul is going to live on forever. Listen, every temptation on this earth falls into one of these three categories. Physical desire, personal desire, self-interest. We're talking about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. If you obtain it all, I mean, it's got absolutely everything in life you've ever dreamed of. Lord, you, you Dwayne got it when he got you. <laughs> but Brother Dwayne, what if you had everything? He's a Mustang man. What, what, what if you had everything in this world you could possibly even hope for? And lose your own soul. And lose, lose the very thing that's going to live on forever in eternity. What have you profited? Nothing. Back to Matthew 16, 26. Part B of that verse. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, so often we think that this is speaking of why here on this earth, what, what would you rather have than, than your soul? And, and you know, what would you, what would you take in exchange? Now, that's not fully what it's saying. I want us to fully understand what it's saying. What shall a man give? Now, this is speaking of something that you already have. Can you give anything that you ain't got? No. Well, but something that you have, what will you give in exchange for your soul? What are you saying? Once your soul is lost, it's lost forever. I'm talking about in hell. Once your soul ends up in hell, lost, separated from God, it's lost forever. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? In other words, what have you profited here on this earth that you could offer to pull your soul out of hell? Nothing. There is no counter price accepted for redemption. You know how you redeem by the blood of Jesus? It's already been shed. The price has already been paid. For your salvation. Yeah. So what could you give in exchange for your soul? Nothing. Right. Spend the rest of your life earning every penny that you can in any kind of crooked way that you can. And put it all in a jar. The rest of your life, every penny you can possibly get your hand on. On judgment day, present it to the Lord. It won't be enough. It, it wouldn't be sufficient to give in exchange for your soul. It is our responsibility to guard and cherish and keep our soul. Yeah. You, know, you know who's going to see that this soul right here makes it? Well, I got my father here this morning. I got my wife. I got my children. I got that when it thinks we hold long services. Mommy, she would. She would. Could nobody do anything to save this soul right here except me and myself. It's our responsibility to guard it, cherish it. Jesus said, if thy right eye offend thee, plug it out. Cast it from thee. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. Cast it from thee. Well, Jesus didn't really mean that. Well, someday maybe you can ask him why he wrote it. If thy right eye offend thee, plug it out. Anything, anything here in this earth that would keep your soul out of heaven, get, get behind it. Get rid of it. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. Listen. 
what's profitable to you? Save your soul. Right. Yeah. Save your soul. Don't let, if this right here offends me, get rid of it. Right. But save the soul. Right. Yeah. It's going to live forever. Yeah. All will come to realize the one day the value of the soul. Amen. Let it not be too late. When you realize the value of your soul. In Luke chapter 16. This has already been shared today too. Maybe we won't share it all. We'll just share part of it. Luke chapter 16 verse 19. There was a certain rich man. Which was clothed in purple and fine linen. And fared sumptuously. Every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Isn't that beautiful? The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may, listen, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, isn't that something to think about? Not, he didn't ask for a, a cup full of water or a handful of water or a splash. Just let him dip the tip of his finger in water. And then he, he had come to realize the value of that tip of water. Just one tip of water. He come it was too late, Brother Dick, but he come to realize it. Yeah. Right. One tip of water. Yeah. All will come to realize one day the value of the soul. Oh, I want to realize it now, don't you? Yeah. What is the greatest danger of losing your soul? I'm trying to hurry. We'll pray for you. What is the greatest danger of losing your soul? Ask yourself right now. Maybe it's Alcohol, maybe it's drugs, maybe it's money, maybe it's wealth. What, you ask, ask yourself, what's the greatest danger in my life of losing my soul? Well, let me tell you what it is. Neglect. That's all it takes. It don't take murder. It don't take adultery. All it takes is neglect. What does neglect mean? Neglect means failure to care for something that you already have. Something that you already... How many has... Anybody in here got a horse? You, have you neglected feeding your horse today? No, you haven't. Why? You don't have one, right? You can't neglect your horse if you don't have a horse, right? But what about... Hebrews 2 and 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Now it's talking about something that, oh, I can't, something that's already been offered to me, something, something that's free for the taking. All we have to do is neglect it. And you know what? We'll be lost. To neglect would be to slide along in a thoughtless, reckless manner in regard to your soul. You don't have to go out and kill anybody. All you have to do is neglect your salvation. The Lord spoke a parable of the rich fool. This man was blessed abundantly on this earth here. His fruit and all that he had was he was blessed so much his barns wouldn't hold it, right? And he, he 
he, he had this problem in life. He had so much he didn't have ever, anywhere to keep it. He said, what, what shall I do? What? Hey man, this is a problem here. What shall I do? You ever had so much you didn't know where to put it? I mean, it's junk, man. <laughs> but he said, I, I'll say, I'll, I'll tell, I'll say what I'll do. I'll tell, I'll say to my soul, I'm gonna go tear down these little rinky dink barns. And I'm gonna build me some big barns, big enough to house all of my profit. And then he said, I'm going to say to my soul, you know, some of us are confused about what value to our soul can be. But he said, I'm going to say to my soul, soul, take ease, rest, drink, be merry. Right? For I've laid up for many years. You have much good. But Jesus said, or God said, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. This, this very night. I want to, in closing, how many of you know what an opportunist is? Anybody, anybody know an opportunist? You may. You may know one closer than you realize. An opportunist is a person who exploits circumstances to gain immediate advantage rather than being guided by consistent principles. An opportunist. Someone who's always looking for to get the advantage. Right? I want to tell us a really quick story of a man who knew the Lord once, who walked with the Lord, who was called, who was appointed, who was sent by the Lord. Matthew chapter 26, verse 14. Then one of the twelve, one of these guys that was handpicked by the Lord, one of the twelve called Judas. Judas is a carrier. Now listen to what this next word says. Went unto the chief priest. Now you see, they didn't come to Judas and catch him off away from the others and a couple of big, rough, burly guys get him down and get his arm behind him. You ever been in school, they get your arm behind you and twist it? And rip? That, you do whatever they would say you do. I think what happened. Judas went. <coughs> he went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. An opportunist. And they kept him with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Now listen, being an opportunist is dangerous grounds. I want us to understand Judas was not evil from the beginning. No, he wasn't. God did not make him evil. He was evil because he did evil. Peter, listen to what Peter says in regards to Judas. Judas, by transgression, failed that he might go to his own place. He made these decisions for himself. God wouldn't be a just God if, to say, I'm going to make this man evil. No, he didn't. But Judas chose he made his way to the chief priest. He said, what would you give me? Because i got contact. I know where he's at. And, oh, that's, that's hard to believe. It. A man who walked with the Lord. He put the value of his soul second to his wants. He became an 
avaricious opportunist. I had to look that word up. It means an extreme greed for wealth. He put 30 pieces of silver is what he put on the scale with his own soul. Wow. 30 pieces of silver. Wow. He coveted with these guys and said, I'll reveal him to you. I'll walk right up to him and kiss him. Now see, Jesus had talked to Peter because Peter had the wrong idea. He had the wrong train of thought about the value of life. Wow. Right? Right? And the Lord began to try to straighten all of this out. But see, Judas here didn't take heed, did he? Mm -mm. He walked right up to the Lord and kissed him. And I believe the Lord called him friend. But he kissed him, love son. And he sold out the Lord. And he doomed his own soul for 30 pieces of silver. Well, Lord convicted him of that. Condemnation set in on him, and he became sorry for what he had done. And he took the 30 pieces of silver back to him and said, I want to return this. And they said, No deal. He had signed his death forms. No deal. We don't want it back. And he ran by the temple and he took the silver and he slung it in at the door. The greed all that he had worked for and accomplished, yeah. eat him up inside. Yeah. And he ran and he hated it himself. Yeah. And he lost it all. Yeah. What would you give in exchange for your soul today? Yeah. What would it profit you if you gained the whole world yeah. to lose your own soul? Yeah. Would you stand with me this morning?